very appropriate that uh, on this uh, occasion at SCAD 16 we have um, Professor Richard Lyon as the Medic One lecturer. Uh, Richard, you've already heard a little bit about today. Um, he's a consultant uh, with me and others at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh in emergency medicine, but one job was just far too small a job plan for Richard. He's also a consultant in HEMS, Cancer of Sussex, and uh, was recently made prof of pre-hospital emergency care at the University of Surrey. Uh, that's not all of what Richard does, but the rest of it you can read in the program. He's far too illustrious for me to uh, read it all out here. So without further ado, um, speaking to us on being awesome, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Professor Richard Lyon. So guys, I don't want this talk to be about me. I want this talk to be about you. You've just had your coffee, you're full of cake. I know what you really want to do is have a bit of a snooze, so that's fine. So I'd like you just to sit back, shut your eyes, and just think about your role in cardiac arrest management. There's people here from all over walks of life, dispatchers, fire, first responders, ambulance, whatever it may be, sit back and think about what you've learned today and think about what you can do to make a difference. That'll probably wake you up a little bit. If you wanted to run away, you don't have to. If there's someone hiding under the seat, you can pull them out. Why am I showing you this? Well, it's a sad state of affairs that actually your chance of having a cardiac arrest is probably about the same as being involved in something like what you've just heard, a marauding terrorist type event, which is exactly why the government have made the Run, Hide, Tell campaign not dissimilar to the Save a Life for Scotland campaign. Because when you hear noise like that, when you're supercharged with emotion, you instantly plunge into that red zone. Anxiety, fear. It's science that tells us that 80% of you in a real life event would freeze you would be paralyzed by fear. You wouldn't be able to think. You would just sit motionless. This is what performance versus stress level looks like. Now, what we need to do is make sure, as resuscitationists, we're performing always in this yellow optimum stress area. But actually, it's so easy to go straight into the red. And actually, I think, right at the end, that's when you get into the kind of brown or yellow, depending on which orifice is about to open next. <laughs> when the police arrive, they will be armed. They may be dressed differently depending on their function. Their first task will be to deal with the immediate threat to prevent further casualties. This may take a long time. So meet Barry. Well, he's not really called Barry, but you're not allowed to know what he's called. He's super secret, isn't he? Barry spends his whole life training. He spends most of his time guarding nuclear installations. He wishes that nothing like this is ever going to happen on anyone. But when it does, like you saw in the video, Barry gets one chance, one chance to get it right. And if he screws it up, someone's going to die. Ring true with anyone here? This is why Barry practices with live ammunition. He and his pals drill, firing real rounds into targets so that on the day of the race, he's got the best possible chance of not screwing it up. Because if he screws it up, someone is going to die. Under pressure, you will all sink to the level of your training. You don't rise to the occasion. Whatever training you've had, when faced with a cardiac arrest, you will fall to it. Under pressure, 
you will sink to the level of that training. Which is why if you're an F-16 pilot, you actually train to 130% of your ability. So that when you're being shot and fired at and it's all going a bit pitong, you will still perform at an acceptable level. And it's all about bandwidth. It's all about having the cognitive processing ability to be able to think in these stressful situations. So when you're faced with a double engine failure and 130 people sitting in the back of your plane, how do you maintain that bandwidth? How do you maintain that clarity of thought to land that plane safely on the Hudson? How do you have the clarity of thought to think about what Shorty told us and decide, should we resuscitate this person, should we not? It's really difficult. But as Captain Sullenberger said, there's just no substitute for experience. But getting this experience is hard, isn't it? We're not all exposed to cardiac arrest every day. Some people in this room will probably have never seen a cardiac arrest, and maybe never will. But that's where we need to train. And we need to train not just on the mannequins, but you need to train in that red zone. The only way of moving that line, OK, so that you're going to function optimally is to train in that red zone under extreme pressure. Now, when Barry signed up to the army, he was, be the best, ooh, yeah, boo, let's go, ooh, ooh. And as Marit so eloquently said this morning, there's no place for egos in resuscitation. Leave your ego at the front door when you run onto the scene. So actually, Marit, I have a favor to ask. If you've got tomorrow, we've got this visitor. If you wouldn't mind going and telling him, <laughs> he could leave his ego at the airport. That would be great. So actually, guys, it's not about being awesome. Barry can't be the best. Captain Sullenberger isn't trying to be the best. All they're trying to do is not screw it up. They're just trying to be safe, and they're trying to do their best. And that's what I'd ask of you, not to be the best. That might, if you're lucky, be a side effect. I'd ask whatever you do in whatever your role is, you've just got to do your best. Now, a few of you have heard of me tell this story before. This is my dad, Clive. Dad was a very successful lawyer, super fit, used to cycle hundreds of miles every weekend. And Dad went to the gym one morning, and I said, I'll join you a bit, Dad. You go ahead. Dad got off the elliptical trainer, and he wasn't feeling very well. He collapsed on the floor of the gym. The call taker realized it was a collapse, but thought it was a seizure, and didn't really understand that it was a cardiac arrest, and there was a bit of a delay in ambulance dispatch. Someone was there that could do CPR and started really quickly, but actually after two minutes they were knackered. I got there after a few minutes, and I couldn't quite remember the ratio, I was a medical student, and I got knackered pretty quick. There was no one else that could help us. There was certainly no AED or pad or anything in the gym at the time. There was nothing we could do but wait the 13 minutes it took for an ambulance to arrive. And when they did, Dad was asystolic on the floor. There was certainly no ECMO or PCI or anything like that. And Dad died on the floor of the gym when he was 48 years old. So I'd ask you guys to think about what your role is. You can't afford to drop the baton. If anyone drops the baton, it's going to go wrong. And I know what it feels like when it goes wrong. So Lion's Law, number one, keep calm and... I'm on live web stream, and you can't, guys, can't do beep, can you? Keep calm and do your best. <laughs> <laughs> I've wanted to be a doctor since I was a really long, a little kid, actually a long, long time, and I joined the volunteer fire service, and I got this passion for pre-hospital care. And many of you know, I came to Edinburgh and continued that passion, and it's truly humbling for me to be here today and thank you for the honorary fellowship from the college. I'm, I'm really touched. I genuinely mean it when I say I work with some of the best teams, both pre-hospital and in the hospital in Edinburgh, that I could ever find. 
And I'd just like to share with you a few of the things I've picked up in the years I've been doing cardiac arrest resuscitation. Who's this? Peter Safar, thank you, Marat. I was hoping someone out there might know. Peter Safar is one of my heroes. Peter Safar is like the godfather of resuscitation, okay? Peter Safar is a resuscitationist. Now, if you remember nothing else, Lion's Law number two, be a resuscitationist. If nothing else, it just sounds really cool, doesn't it? I'm a resuscitationist. So what does it mean? What does being a resuscitationist mean to me? Well, first and foremost, it means you're a local champion. You're a champion of the best possible cardiac arrest care you can do, wherever it's a community response, fire, dispatch, ambulance. You've got to have that flame in you to want to do better. And that's what all of the good cities around the world have. And Peter so eloquently described death not being a pathophysiological process, but so it's a pathophysiological process, not a moment. Now, what does that mean? You don't just die. You have a window of opportunity. And actually, the patient's not dying. The patient's trying to survive. And it's up to you to use that window of opportunity to give them the opportunity of life back. And think about that. They look dead. Their trace says they're dead, but they are trying to survive. And you know how to do it. You know about the chain of survival, and you know that your region needs not the Team GB who dumped the baton at every single frickin' Olympics. You need Jamaican relay-style resuscitation, okay? One chain to the next, seamlessly feeding into the other. But one thing I do know, guys, it's not about clever stuff. It's about doing the basics really, really, really well. Pre-hospital care is about being awesome at the basics, and there's just no substitute for good CPR and that training that we talked about earlier. Because the chain of survival is not linear, actually. The chain of survival is front-end loaded. It's all in the first little bit. It's all in your hands, not mine, as a hospital practitioner. If there's no bystander CPR on dad, if there's no early defibrillation, and we get him back after 40, 45 minutes, it's just not going to work. We're going to create an organ donor with a dead brain. We need to nail the first few rungs so that everyone else can follow suit. So having done my sort of cardiac arrest stuff, I thought, I want to do this pre-hospital care stuff. I think this is pretty, you know, Gucci. This is pretty cool. I got the bug. So what do you do when you get the bug? You go off to London and they give you a flight suit. I even got the shades. You know, you fly around, you land in Trafalgar Square, you go running through the crowds to get out of the way, Hem's coming through. I was the dog's bollocks. This was just <laughs> awesome. It was so cool. This is what my job looked like. Awesome. I was, I'd made it. I was exactly where I wanted to be in my career. And then it all went wrong. The whole thing changed. And it all changed at this one moment. This girl got hit by a car. She bullseyed the windscreen with her head. She was low GCS. She needed an anesthetic. No problem, Hems doctor, Hems team coming through. We inject the anesthetic drugs. She falls asleep. We give the muscle relaxant. She stops breathing. I get out my laryngoscope. I look down and can see nothing. 
absolutely nothing. My whole world completely descended into this tiny little space of the back of her mouth. I was in the red zone, totally maxed, totally falling apart. I didn't even notice her sat crashing through the floor, her bradycardia, as I risked killing this patient. Now, what I should have known is this is actually a well-recognized phenomenon. Dunning-Kruger effect, what happens to your experience over time versus your confidence? You go down to London, you get super confident, you're way up there, and then what happens at this pinnacle? I was at the absolute pinnacle of Mount Stupid. <laughs> Just about to fall off and crash into this sea okay, of despair. So what happened then? A hand came onto my shoulder. It's okay, Richard, no problem. You're doing good. Just going to pull out, just going to oxygenate her, back up, have a think about what we're going to do. That sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> Richard, don't worry. Let's just adjust your position a little bit. How about we use a bit of a burp maneuver? No problem. You're going to get this tube in. The voice of Dean Bateman. Six Hems tours, calm as you like, totally on top of his game, completely bailed me out of killing this poor girl. That is the moment I realized, one, I'm not worthy. Pre-hospital care is the domain of paramedics and will stay the domain of the paramedics. But it also taught me something very, very, very important. The road to self-insight runs through others. So when I got to the back of the base and the boss says, hey, Richard, can I give you some feedback? It doesn't really mean that. It doesn't it say, Richard, come to the office. I want to pummel you for telling you you've screwed up. That's what it really means. All right? We're not very good at this, and we need to be better at this. As resuscitationists, we've got to learn to talk to each other and learn from each other and be wide open to feedback. Dean sat me down and said, let's have a chat about this, Rich. You were kind of nearing code brown there, weren't you? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I really was. Okay, well, how did I know you were code brown? Well, you went quiet. How can we work on this so next time you don't do that? It was brilliant. So here's my advice to you. Every job you do, every resuscitation, every patient you see, search for feedback and employ three rules. Do it often. Do it often so it becomes the norm. So it's not some surprise, but you can do it all the time. Be honest so that actually it's valuable and do it in a nice way. Do it often, be honest, and be nice. And that's the way I think we can really improve, especially in these red zone moments. Now you've seen this picture lots of times, pit crew resuscitation. I'm not going to bang on about it. I just want to say a few things that I've learned about pit crew resuscitation. First of all, it's not totally applicable to what we do, is it? Why? Because these guys do the same thing every time. It's the same tires and the same fuel. We have different patients, different environments, and crucially, different people. This is what pit crew resuscitation looks like in Norway. So the first thing I'd say is you need a team leader. Someone has got to lead, and we've said that before. Secondly, we work in teams, we've got to train in teams. And our team is not the same every time. We need to work with fire and rescue, community response, doctors, nurses, different ambulance services, so that we can all intercalate and work well with each other. If we're going to work in teams, we need to train in teams. Lisa, was that the FaceTime you wanted earlier? Is that it? Okay, sorry guys, let me just, um, I better just get this. And if, it, if it's the kids, do you want me to shut them up? Okay, no worries. Oh, it's Paul. Oh my. Jeez. Um, so, uh, better just get this. He's a pretty important guy. Um, Paul, listen, mate, I'm in the middle of a, a lecture just now. Is it re really important? What's up? What's the matter? Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Uh, just wanted to ask you something. I've got this pain in my chest up my, my left shoulder. It's, it's been like that all day, and I, honestly, I, f I feel like shit. I'm not surprised, right? You look like shit, I have to say. 
you know what? You need to stop doing all these freaking smack Copenhagen government RRU ambulance service. It's all a bit much. Listen, mate, do me a favor. Pull out your phone and just put your hands on the two, uh, the two little sensors on the back of your iPhone. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Getting that loud and clear. It's not looking good, actually. Uh, sorry, Paul. It's no problem, mate. It's all good. Um, just looking at your trace that you're sending through to me, mate. Just want to have a look on the good Sam. <laughs> you know what? Um, there's some responders around, but there's no defib. Um, you know what, Paul? You know that um, defib drone thing that Steve was banging on about? I'm going to send you one of them, mate. So I think you need to wire this up to you, all right? And see when the pads arrive, just put it on so that... Um, if it does go, you know, a little bit skewish, um, you're gonna, um, you know, I'll, I've got your back, mate. I've got your back. It's right. It's coming through. Okay, Paul. So when it arrives with you, okay. Ooh. If it doesn't, just call nine nine nine. Resuscitation is all about technology. Everything I just showed you is real. We have it today. We have iPhones that can do ECGs. Apple is investing loads of money in all this stuff. We have drones that can, you know, deliver defibs. The reason I did the traumatic arrest workshop at the beginning was in case the drone went that way. <laughs> we need to embrace technology. The stands you see out there are not enemies. They're not salesmen. They're our friends and they're our partners. And we need to work closely with them to develop the best possible resuscitation technologies we can. Because you've heard today from Steve and various others about how important these programs are. So, be a resuscitationist. Be a local champion. Go for the feedback. Work on the teams and embrace technology. Lion's Law number two, be a resuscitationist. Now this guy's awesome, isn't he? He's absolutely awesome. One of the best Olympians of all time, Chris Hoy. Like Barry, he gets one shot to get it right. One shot in the Olympic final. If he screws it up, bye-bye medal. But what is even more awesome than Chris Hoy? Well, I think that what is more awesome is the team behind Chris Hoy. British cycling has totally taken the world by storm. And one of the things they've used, led by Sir David Brailsford, is this aggregation of marginal gains. Lion's Law number three, go for the marginal gains. So what does that mean? So the British cycling team realized that actually, if they had a good pillow at night, they'd sleep a little bit better. If their diet was just that bit better, they'd gain 0.01 performance. If they let their girlfriend stay with them in the nights running up to the race, it meant they weren't going out there sex-deprived, frustrated, and angry. <laughs> All these things added up. They might have been little bits, but when you aggregated the marginal gains, they produced a really big effect. And that's what we need to do. We need to look for the small bits of improvement. There's no wonder bullet for this. We need to work together in a long-term fashion and see where the little bits of reward can go. So just to sum up, I hit that rock bottom moment on the side of the road when I could not intubate the patient. It destroyed me. This was my second very close brown trouser moment. Kai was two the week before Christmas when a small strand of cardiomyopathy put Kai into VF. His mum did CPR on him. I arrived. He kept re-arresting. He was unstable. I had never anesthetized a child in my life. I knew I was going to have to anesthetize him on his kitchen table the week before Christmas in front of his mum, who had just done CPR on her two-year-old son. This was brown trouser stuff. Thankfully, it all went really well. And the day I went to see Kai in Great Ormond Street, was the day it all made sense. Every exam, every hour of study, 
every setback, every being told you can't do this, you can't do that, was fine. And it was fine because of that one moment. I'd learnt what ikigai was. I had no idea what ikigai meant, but I had found my ikigai. And all of you are in this amazing position because ikigai is Japanese for that sense of well-being, that sense of inner satisfaction. And it's made up of different things. The things we love, the things we're good at, the things that the world needs. And hey, if we even get paid for doing it, freaking bonus. <laughs> Some people spend their whole life searching for moments like this. And you guys can have it as often as you sign on to your community responder, as often as you go out to these cardiac arrest calls. One icky guy moment makes all the missed meal breaks, the four-hour target, the poor performance, the you-know-what, just go away because it's all worth it. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we started this morning. This is the quote Gareth used in his opening speech, Shackleton's advert for men. So I read this, small wages, bitter, dark, long months, dark, constant danger, honor, no recognition. It's a bit like going to work at Edinburgh City Station, is it not, in the winter? <laughs> but shift happens, and it absolutely happens. The men of the Shackleton adventure changed the face of mankind from an adventure point of view. And ladies and gentlemen, in Scotland today, we live in a universe of uncertainty, not least after what happened last night. <laughs> but for the first time I have ever seen, to be honest, in any country, the planets are aligning, and they're aligning in the most fantastic fashion. Never could I have dreamt that all these organizations would start coming together pre-hospital, ambulance, research, community response, charity, training kids in schools, all under one umbrella of a government that is backing it and a government that is saying, we need to do this. It's just amazing. And it's amazing for you to be part of it. And you are the ones that are going to make this happen. So my plea to you is to go out there and do the very best you can. Be a resuscitationist and search for those marginal gains that is going to save all of those lives because, believe me, Ikigai is worth it. Thank you very much for your attention.